Happy Friday, everyone. We have got a Jersey retirement in Buffalo for Ryan Miller. We've now got the full all-star team and jerseys to discuss, plus all of the weekend action ahead on today's Locked On NHL. Your Locked On NHL, your daily podcast on the National Hockey League. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello once again. Uh, welcome to Locked On NHL for Friday, January 20th. I am Rachel Donner from Locked On Flyers. You can find me on Twitter at rmiriam. I'm here each and every Friday with Gil Martin of Locked On Isles. And you can find him on Twitter at Ice Wars NYR VSNYI. Thanks for making Locked On NHL your first listen every day. We are free and available on all your favorite podcasting platforms. Plus, you can watch us over on YouTube. How you doing, Gil? I am good. It's Friday, and uh, it's it's a good time to be a hockey fan. Lots going on. Yeah, listen, uh, I am very happy to be talking about other things besides Ivan Provorov on today's show. <laughs> But uh, yeah, Ryan Miller gets his jersey retired in Buffalo. Well-deserved. Uh, he played a total of 11 seasons with the Sabres, uh, leading that team in wins and saves games by a goalie. He's in the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame. Uh, he, you know, he is such an intrinsic part of Sabres history, despite the fact that he played for other teams in his career and it's because of that longevity 11 seasons as their number one goalie it is really you know something that entrenches you in the mythos of a team yeah and he he was so good for them winning a Vesna trophy and just sort of I, I love the way he approached the game and yeah I mean the other thing is you know when you think of goalies it in Buffalo, it's him and, and Dominic Hasek who are probably yep. the first two that come to mind. Exactly. And, and I think th that's part of it that, you know, with Buffalo's history, you know, they've really only had those two as longstanding goaltenders that have made such an impact like that. And, you know, you add that to his impressive international hockey career you know he is just one of those staples in league history that um you know i just i just wanted a little bit more from him in his career not that it's his fault per se i just want right. it for him you know i think for me the most heartbreaking part of it is that 2010 olympics in vancouver you know, where he had such a phenomenal tournament and made incredible saves and for Team USA to lose that game to Canada like that. It, it, I, I understand for Canadians it was a great day and, you know, more power to you. But I think uh, that was that was rough. And I don't want to focus on like a bad day, but I just wanted him to get that gold medal so badly because he was such a staple of, of USA Hockey's you know, team in that era. He was. And, you know, uh, uh, just like so many other members of his family, Michigan State grad. And I, I just love the way he got ready for games. I remember, you know, him sort of being almost meditative before games started and sort of getting into the zone. And, and it was it was just a cool way to prepare for games. And then he would go out and play exceptionally well for such a long time and took the Sabres on a few long playoff runs as well. So uh, more power to him and he will definitely be missed. Yes, uh, indeed. And one of my favorite thing about Jersey retirement ceremonies just across the board and his was no different is in a lot of cases, 
the peak of these guys' careers happened maybe before they got married or had kids or things like that, or their kids were super young while they played. And this is a chance for the kids are a little bit older now, and they really get to see how much their dad was appreciated by the fans in that city and, you know, understand it in a way that maybe they couldn't when they were real little. And this was, yeah, this was no different. He talked about that specifically, you know, having the kids out there for the ceremony and um, the Sabres did such a good job with everything combined with all the guests that were there. And, you know, the way he talked about his first visit to the arena and seeing, you know, the, the French connection guys jerseys up in the rafters and maybe that could be me someday i I just love those kinds of stories in hockey and it's like one of the reasons why i love the sport so much is that you feel this generational connection that flows through the history of the game yeah and and the fact that he respected the history of the of the franchise so much and then becomes an integral part of that history there's a certain poetic justice there as well there really is. So uh, congrats to him. And I hope he's enjoyed the full weekend and has a wonderful retirement as it is well deserved. Yeah. And, and for Sabres fans kind of fitting that they got the win. It was against my Islanders last night, but uh, <laughs> Buffalo deserved to win that game. Uh, and, and yeah, you know, it, it's always sort of a bummer when, they retire a player's jersey and then the team goes out and loses six to one. You know, you don't want to see that. So uh, sort of takes the air out of the uh, out of the evening. That did not happen last night. <laughs> well, I'm sorry for your Islanders, but. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, it is what it is, right? <laughs> it was Ryan Miller's night and that was a poetic justice kind of way to end it. Yeah, well, Ryan Miller is definitely an all-star uh, in his time. And now we have some new all-stars for this year's all-star game to discuss. They released the results of the fan vote. So we got three additional players on each roster. And, you know, I have to say, uh, while these are well-deserved players in terms of, you know, the seasons they've put together, It's pretty boring, like no surprises here. So (laughs) in the Central Division, they added Miko Rantanen, Nathan McKinnon from the abs. Uh, uh, I think that that was, you know, pretty obvious there. Connor Hellebuck in net, uh, again, just a, a staple right now of top goaltenders in that division. Pacific, Leon Dreisaitl, of course, had to get at, like there was no way. Um, that you could go without him. Uh, Stuart Skinner getting the goaltender spot in that division. And then Bo Horvat, who's been one of the few bright spots for the Canucks this season, uh, having a a really good year. And so, you know, again, both of those divisions having uh, two players from the same team added. In fact, three of the four divisions had two of the three coming from the same team. And, you know, we had that in the Metro with Artemi Panarin and Adam Fox getting added for the Rangers. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Ilya Sorokin of the Islanders also named to the team. And But, you know, here's the thing. You go down this list, and as you said, they were boring. And I'll put that in air quotes if, if you don't mind. But the reason they're boring is because the way the, the thing is formatted, they were just – too many deserving players who are not going to get named to the team initially because they limit it to right. one for every team. And, you know, if there are two great goalies, for example, in a division, you can't send both of them. So when you add, they need one from every team and they need to be able to have one player at every position, you, you sort of get into a situation where there are so many great players omitted, you're not going to get those surprises. Yeah, and I I think that, you know, from my perspective, as somebody who covers the Flyers, I think that, you know, while I I don't think that Kevin Hayes is a bad selection, Travis Konechny was the right one. And in a fan vote situation like this, like Travis Konechny just wasn't going to get 
in. Like he just wasn't, you know, especially when you have, you know, in the Metro division, really only that one slot and Artemi Panarin like is a no brainer. Right. So yeah, I, I feel like it, it doesn't really give some of the right guys the opportunity to play and it should just be the best players. And, um, or you just go straight personality. It's like you can't kind of try and have it both ways and where it doesn't work. And to me, you know, I say boring, but it's based on, you know, you know wanting to have the most fun watching the All-Star right. game. Well, the, the other alternative is to expand the rosters a little bit. I mean, the game is supposed to be fun anyway. Do, do, does anybody even remember which team won the All-Star game a year or two ago? It, to me, if they expanded the roster and put five more players on every division's uh, list for, for the All-Star game, I wouldn't mind that. More people, more fun, go for it, and and let the deserving players get the honors that they're entitled to. Yeah, and add more skills to the skills competition, yeah. you know, that are more uh, out of left field, you know, like the ones they did in Vegas were fun. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you know, you can do stuff like that. So, yeah, uh, we definitely uh, have a predictable result here, but still, uh, I think it should be fun. I like what's going on with the merging of the all star and reverse retro theme here. We're going to talk more about that coming up next. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious treat but don't want all the fat and calories, then you've got to try a Built Bar. We just got through the holidays. I know my goal is to eat a little healthier this year. But if you're like me and you want to eat healthier, you don't want to compromise taste. Well, I've got the thing for you. you got to try Built. With Built, healthy is actually tasty. And for starters, all Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate, and they come in great flavors like peanut butter brownie, cookies and cream, churro, and coconut almond. And the macros are outstanding, just 130 calories, just 4 grams of sugar, but they pack a whopping 17 grams of protein. Now, we've been telling you, you can go to Built.com to get your Built Bars, and that is still true. You can check out the website. But now you can also get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. So head on over to Built.com, Walmart or Sam's Club to get the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, Built Bar. Gil, they also released the jerseys for All-Star Weekend. And from my uh, observation, it feels like they're a little divisive, but I happen to really love them. What do you think? I I don't mind them at all. I think they look good. You're kind of going for a reverse retro look. Uh, You know, yeah, why not? I I mean, I I don't have any problem with them. Uh, What, are some people objecting to this, the the color scheme or what, what, what is the issue here? Um, I think that, you know, it could be leaning too hard into the Miami vice of it all, um, especially because the game is in Sunrise, which is definitely not Miami. (laughs) But uh, (laughs) I I will say that I I love this old school look in terms of the logos. Like you you just don't see the puck with the NHL in it anymore. And I love seeing that. Maybe it's nostalgia for me that this will only hit with people that the retro term kind of applies to. But I do remember having logos very similar to this on almost every All-Star jersey for a very long time. And like it wasn't a thing where people were like, oh, I want to buy that jersey. Like the jersey was more utilitarian. It wasn't for consumption at the time. And so uh, I I do like it. And yeah, I just have a thing for that, the puck with the NHL on it. I, I like it when that's in the design. I, I like it. And and as you mentioned, it's appropriate for where the game is being played, the, the sort of tropical looking uh, layout and color scheme. So, uh, you know, I have no problem with them. I think they're kind of nice. And you know, again, it's an all-star game. You can't take these things too seriously. Just sit back and enjoy. 
that, that yeah that <laughs> i <all> agree <laughs> But I do like the, you know, the overall logo and yes. design theme for this all-star game with the Florida and the palm trees and just the bright colors, you know, and even on this jersey, they have that logo on the shoulder and then your team's logo on the other shoulder. So, you know, I like that they're incorporating the theme of the whole weekend into the design as well. You know, even with the roster list that was released, you know, they had all of that bright color design you know incorporated and i think that's fun i mean you know the nhl can be a little bland sometimes <laughs> no and so i you know you know it just is what it is but i think that uh, this is a really fun color combination and um i think it'll be cool to see the, these jerseys out there on the ice i agree i'm looking forward to it and it's hard to believe we're getting what what are we about two two and a half weeks away from all-star weekend here so two weeks yeah and uh, that's a good uh, transition well done gil <laughs> <laughs> in terms of what i want to talk about next is you know we're approaching the all-star break and we have the bye week schedule returning this season after a couple of years away because of shortened season and COVID and, and all of that. And, you know, so it's been a while since our teams have had, you know, this full week break to it where, you know, what they do is they kind of overlay the all-star weekend and some teams will have their bye week before and some after and so it's an interesting thing in the NHL schedule and there are pros and cons to it. Uh, and of course it was negotiated into the CBA, but you know, I think that what it can do is give teams rest and, you know, injury recovery time, but it could also kill momentum, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 a lot of it depends on what your team, it, where they're at kind of heading into the bye week and you don't want to have a team that's playing very well and then get, you know, lose that intensity, lose that concentration and lose that momentum. As you said, that can be very disruptive. But, you know, a team that is dealing with injuries, a team that is slumping, uh, you know, that can really be a, a reset for them and benefit them. So, you look, it's fair if every team has a week off and they know it's built in and and. When you consider the wear and tear on players' bodies, that you're talking about 82 regular season games, maybe five or six preseason games, playoffs, all that stuff, you're talking about roughly 100 games for a lot of these players. Um, to me, giving them a week off in the middle of the season is just smart from a physical standpoint. And I think in the long run, it helps the, the product be of higher quality over the second half of the season because the players will be a little bit less physically run down and they can emotionally recharge their batteries as well. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely those pros and cons that you mentioned. Uh, you know, some teams have as small as an eight day break and some teams have an 11 day break. Right. So it's not exactly fair across the league. You know, you know some teams it's in between. Uh, as well. And I think you know, the other aspect of it for me is that when you have this long break in the season, but you're trying to fit the season in a similar overall time frame, I don't like how it compresses the schedule in January, where you have teams that are playing, you know, four or five games in you know, seven or eight days for like two weeks in a row leading up to this break. Like, does that week off really compensate for that compressed schedule? I don't know what the answer is there. Or you have a week off and then you come back to a super compressed schedule where it's not like, you know, the beginning of the season where you have preseason games with more days in between, you know, to ramp up. This is like going, you know, you're gone for a week and then you could have a four game week. And I understand these are professional athletes, but those kind of things can really kind of mess with your your rhythm and your routine. And so, you know, I just wonder if there is some harm here as well as the good. I, I think there is. And, and I think you sort of hit it on the head as far as the compressed schedule. I mean, uh, to use the Islanders 
as an example, they played this week, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday. Uh, and then they have a similar schedule again next week for four games, and then they get the break. So the bye week. So, yeah, you do sort of pay the price for getting that week off. I guess it's very similar to people who take a vacation. You know, the week before your vacation, you got to do extra stuff just to, <laughs> you know, just to make sure everything's in place when you get to go away. And then the week you come back, there's all this extra stuff that piled up while you were away. It's, I guess it's sort of reality, you know, I mean, as far as vacations go. That is a fair point. I can certainly relate to that in terms of, you know, the prep for the vacation is sometimes, you know, a little bit more overwhelming than not taking the vacation on its own. Yeah. Yeah. So why should but, hockey players be different, right? <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Well, speaking of those busy schedules, we've got a busy weekend of games coming up, and we are going to talk about that next. Gil, it's a, a real interesting schedule this weekend. We have 14 games on Saturday to talk about, but only two tonight, uh, Ottawa at Pittsburgh and Colorado at Vancouver. And, uh, you know, I think the Ottawa at Pittsburgh game should be interesting because this is uh, part of a home and home, if I recall correctly. Yeah, it is. And, and both of these teams are sort of on the periphery of the playoff fight right now, sort of just on the outside looking in. And they both need to, to put some wins together. Uh, you know, Pittsburgh only three, five and two in their last 10 uh, yeah, they, they, they run so hot and cold this year. What is with the inconsistency in Pittsburgh this year? Yeah, it is pretty baffling. And, you know, they have been streaky in the past and they just managed to always kind of get it together for the playoffs, uh, and make those incredible runs to, you know, they, they've had a number of cups in doing it this way, where there were portions of those seasons where you weren't quite sure what was going on with this team. And, you know, this could be a repeat of that. Um, but in other ways, it feels quite different that, you know, the things that they're weak on right now are things that you really need going into a strong playoff. So we'll see what happens with them, you know, as the rest of the season progresses. Maybe that all-star break and bye week will help them Maybe. to reset uh, that we just talked about. But yeah, Pittsburgh has been a real interesting team to follow this season. Yeah, and then look at Colorado. Three wins in a row, slowly kind of creeping up in the standings. Uh, third place now in the Western Conference. You knew they were going to sort of, when they got healthier, climb the standings a little bit, and maybe it's starting to happen right now, although that central division is super tight. It really is. You know, you look at the top of that division as well, and, you know, with, uh, you know, Winnipeg and Dallas battling it out, I think that uh, I don't know how this is going to turn out because both teams have – played really strong but have had moments of you know weakness creep in and I, I just I don't know I, I'm not gonna certainly bet on on how that division is gonna turn out but you know like uh, uh, we turn to Saturday's games and there are some really interesting matchups to take a look at and you know, some intra-Canadian games, especially. So looking at you, Toronto at Montreal, yep. Winnipeg at Ottawa. And so that'll, that'll make for some fun TV as well as Edmonton at Vancouver. So we've got pretty much uh, a good night for hockey watching in Canada on Saturday. Yeah, uh, you got to love when, when Canadian teams go head to head. And, and like Winnipeg and Ottawa, not a traditional rivalry East. Eastern Conference versus Western Conference, but they're still really fun and it, it should make for some great hockey on Saturday. Indeed. And then I think uh, the Wild playing at Florida, you know, Florida has just been one of the bigger disappointments this season and Minnesota is trying to establish an identity, which I, I don't know that they really have one right now. And 
So just seeing these teams that are kind of in flux, uh, I, I think that that's always an interesting storyline to follow. And, you know, leading up to the all-star game in Florida, mm -hmm. you know, that we were just talking about, you know, they want to put their best foot forward um, and they haven't so far this season. So uh, that'll be one that I'll keep an eye on. Yeah, that, that will be a very interesting game. And, and, you know, the, the Panthers, they just haven't quite seemed to have gelled the right way. Uh, so much turnaround during the off season on that roster after winning the president's trophy a year ago, you still get the feeling there's enough talent on that roster though, to make a run in the second half. They could, they very well could. Uh, I think that division is really tough though. So yes. It's like, you know, the Panthers are kind of on the outside looking in by, you know, a full 10 points now to the Lightning who are in third place. And I just, I just don't see, you know, obviously the Bruins are yeah <laughs> well established at the top of that division. And then Toronto is so strong as well. And so there really just doesn't seem to be room for Florida at the top there. They have their work cut out for them. They'll have to really go on a hot streak to get back into the divisional fight. No question. Yeah. Uh, what about that uh, Carolina at Islanders game, Gil? Like, what's going on with the Islanders? And how do you think they'll match up against that Carolina team, which is real tough? Yeah, I can't say right now that I'm overly confident. Uh, the Islanders can't score enough goals. Uh, they just don't seem to get enough shots on goal. And, you know... Even last night, Ilya Sorokin made more than 40 saves, kept them in a game they really were being dominated by Buffalo. Unfortunately, with the injuries the Islanders are dealing with, that's been the same old song over the last month. January has been real, real tough for the Islanders. Hurricanes right now playing some pretty good hockey. Still haven't lost 10 games, and we're approaching the All-Star break. Yeah. And the other big game is Colorado at Seattle, who like Seattle is atop the Pacific division now, like who'd have thunk. But uh, I think that, you know, Colorado, who's trying to, you know, overcome some of the struggles they had with injuries, you know, and get back in into it. Uh, they have, you know, one, three in a row right now. I think this is going to be a, a real kind of, you know, line in the sand kind of game for both teams. Yeah, I, I think we'll see if Colorado is hitting on all cylinders and starting to make their move, getting healthy, beating Seattle in Seattle would be a big way to prove that. And, uh, you know, there's some other great late games on Saturday. I mean, Washington and Vegas is another great matchup as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and games in Vegas are always a good time to watch. <laughs> and Sunday, there are fewer games, but some of them are good. Uh, you know, we talked about Pittsburgh. They're going to be at New Jersey and who are, I, I think, have faltered a little bit, but are getting kind of a little bit more consistent, I think, right now. And so that's a good thing. And then uh, I think. You know, there's a little bit of some mismatches here, but this is opportunities for some of the weaker teams to really, you know, establish themselves. I think, you know, San Jose at Boston, that's going to be a tough game yeah. for San Jose for sure. Uh, but, you know, Vegas goes into Arizona and I think, you know, Mullet Arena has proven to be a really tough venue for teams to come into. And so that one will be a lot of fun as well. A little geographic rivalry going. Too. And then Winnipeg visiting Philadelphia. Talk to me about your Flyers. Can they upset the Jets at home? I don't know, because both teams are going to be on the back half of a back to back for this one. And so there's going to be a, a little bit of the sloppiness, I think, will take hold in this game. Uh, but Winnipeg is just so good right now that I, I, I just... I don't know. It depends on which Flyers team shows up. The ones that can play defense or the one that can't. Right. <laughs> I think that'll, <laughs> that'll be the determining factor. We're going to find out, right? <laughs> yep. We will for sure. 
Uh, that will do it for today's show. Thanks so much for listening. Gil, you'll be back on Monday with your show, checking in with NHL teams and their hosts from around the Locked On NHL crew. And we'll both be back next Friday to recap next week and look ahead to the following week. Uh, once again, you can find me on Twitter at rmiriam. Gil is on Twitter at IceWarsNYRVSNYI. Have a great weekend, everyone.